What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 164. And today we are talking about another true crime case. Today we're talking about a disappearance. And this one is one of those ones that could have so many different possibilities at the end. Like, I'm sure there'll be so many different comments with different theories. Yeah, it really draws a lot of similarities to the Maura Murray case. I yeah. feel like, you know. Yes, in some ways. In some Definitely ways. in some ways. Definitely no. not like the same, yeah. you know, case by any means, but just some mm -hmm. of the similarities, you know, car wreck in the forest yeah. and then vanishing from that point. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild to think about. It really is. It's It's been really interesting just thinking about this the last 24 hours, Josh and I talking about it and trying to come up with what we think happened. And I still don't think I really have a conclusion. Like, no, I, I don't really I, lean any specific way. No. And it, I mean, there's some recent developments that might, you know, provide some more answers. But mm -hmm. as far as the, you know, theory of what happens to Leah Roberts is still a mystery. So, yeah, I it mean, is really hard to say. Yeah. So, yes, Josh just said we are talking about Leah Roberts today. Very, very interesting case. Um, before we get into it, the vibes are a little different today. I know that the top comment today is going to be how yeah. we switched seats. <laughs> I know. I know. You, we never think it'd be like a big deal, but it always is. It always is. People don't like you to fuck with the vibe at all. Like you get used to it. I'm, you get used I'm to. liking sitting on this side, actually. Do you? Yeah, I do. Because I do like all my I do lights out on that side, too. So maybe and sometimes like that's where I do the sesh. So, yeah. So it's like sometimes doing multiple podcasts you know mm -hmm. now that kendall and i host you know additional shows like we it's hard to like transition ourselves from different podcasts to this one i feel like yeah and my problem is like i come from a very dark serious podcast you know and yeah. so sometimes i bring that vibe into this show like you're too serious yeah exactly and i'm i'm used to the sesh where and it's so, like you know yeah. a party every episode <laughs> so you know maybe switching sides so for loose. this might be the that's so interesting that you said that because i was gonna say sitting over here i feel like more professional i feel more like josh <laughs> so maybe you're like in the fun seat yeah. now and i'm the serious yeah guy. i'm like ready to break out the, the margaritas <laughs> like i don't know if we're gonna stay like this but basically i don't know why i'm so cool today it's a fucking hot day here in colorado it's it is is it july yet no it's not not even it's close not. <laughs> it's june 9th <laughs> Well, and it's like, but it's hot. It feels like July already. Well, our studio is built in an all metal garage, basically, and it's insulated and we have a ceiling and stuff. But like you can just feel the, you know, furnace that is above, you know, this area above us. Well, it's, you can feel it, but. Oh, yeah, I guess you like it because it's I, cold. Well, I was hoping that it was going to be warm enough today that I could wear a T-shirt because most of the time I wear sweatshirts on the show because it's so cold in here. <laughs> and one of the biggest arguments we have in this studio is over our air conditioning unit, which we call the Dara Chow. And uh, yeah, sometimes Josh likes everything to be really cold. Like you would not even believe how cold we sleep in our bedroom. It is a tundra. It's, I mean, we Slash have hurricane. an air conditioning yeah. unit, an actual air conditioner in our house, plus, plus a window unit, plus a fan, plus an overhead fan. <laughs> Four different sources Four, yeah. of cool air. Like it's so cold in there. It's like, I get up to pee and I get so cold. I'm like, <laughs> but I've gotten really used to it. But I don't know, today I just feel freezing and I couldn't sit over there because the fan is right over where Josh is sitting right now. And he didn't want to turn it off. So our only solution was to switch seats. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to sweat while we're trying to record. Well, you know? I'm not trying to be cold. I'm over here with a blanket. I was like, if I sit over there, I'm going to have to literally be covered in a blanket or I need to go get a sweatshirt. <laughs> It feels cold. It's it's a hard life we live, isn't it? <laughs> Trying it is, to figure out what temperature with, to keep things yeah, at. Yeah, I feel like a lot of couples can relate yeah. to trying to agree on a temperature. That's like one of the hardest things in a relationship. But anyway, Anyways. we also have different vibes today because Janelle's not here. Janelle has come down with the sickness. Not 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 COVID, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to scare anybody. Not the sickness. Not the but... sickness. We don't know what it is, but she's on like, you know, Z pack and too much sun, maybe. Could have been. Yeah, she got a wicked bad sunburn when we were out of town. We went down to Mexico recently. And yeah, so I think she's just been having a fever for a couple of days now and we did not want to get whatever she had. So we have Corelli here today. If you have not seen Corelli, um, she's also she works on the sesh with me. So if you've not seen our show, you may not have heard of her yet or met her met her. <laughs> Heard her voice or seen her face. <laughs> yeah, her beautiful face. But yes, she is going to do cameras for us today as we go through this case. So 
Are you ready to jump in? Yeah, let's go ahead and get into things. This episode is actually brought to you by HelloFresh Care of Raycon Rothies and Simply Safe. More about that later, but yeah, let's dive into this disappearance case because okay. there's a lot to cover. Obviously, we want to, you know, give some background information on, you know, the missing person, and that is Leah Roberts. So mm-hmm. take it away. So Leah Toby Roberts was born on July 23rd, 1976 in Durham, North Carolina. She grew up in the suburbs with her two older siblings, Kara and her brother Heath, and they were a very close family. Leah loved spending time with her parents and her siblings. Kara specifically, she was very close with. They were only two years apart. Kara was two years older than her, and they were just best friends from a super young age. Leah is described as being someone who is very charming, smart, and pretty. She was a thoughtful person and a reflective person, but also very personable. Everyone who met Leah couldn't help but like her. She was very friendly. Yeah, and her brother even said that a good way to describe her is an old soul. You know, just somebody who's wise beyond her years and just, you know, everybody likes having somebody like that around, I feel like. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Leah is... You know, just a very awesome person. Everybody that meets her likes her. Very personable, great smile. But, um, you know, she was kind of private also, definitely. Like, very sweet and nice, but it took a while to get to know her. So things were going pretty well for Leah when she was in high school. But then suddenly her dad was diagnosed with chronic lung disease. And she was only 17 years old at the time and was terrified. She was very close with her father and couldn't believe this was happening. And this was one of the first of many tragedies in her very young life. And dealing with her dad's illness was really hard on her family, especially her mom, so much so that eventually she developed a heart condition, which possibly could have been caused by all the stress. But it seemed like they kind of had it under control, being monitored by doctors. In 1995, Leah graduated high school and she enrolled in North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is about a 30 minute drive from her family's home. She majored in anthropology and minored in Spanish, and eventually she became fluent in Spanish. She also played soccer in college. And during her sophomore year, her mom ended up suffering a heart attack and she died. And this was a total shock to all three kids and their dad. So that's, I mean, that's extremely tragic. And I can't even imagine how that rocked their family. I mean, Mm -hmm. to already having to deal with, you know, their father and him being ill, and then now to have this kind of seemingly come out of nowhere because again there wasn't like a huge cause for concern around her mother's illness at Mm -hmm. that time and so it was kind of like boom and then yeah they're just kind of left and they were like like, so worried about her dad and then this happens with their mom i mean god just completely torn apart that's just so much fear for a family you know to have both parents sick and then and possibly could pass at any time too and then you know one of them does and you're so afraid it's going to happen to the other right So Leah took time off of school to be with her family and grieve the sudden loss. Eventually, she went back for fall semester of 1998. But then her life was disrupted once again. She got in a serious car accident. A transfer truck pulled out right in front of her, and there was no time for her to break. Just before the collision, she was sure that she was going to die. However, she did survive the crash. She was seriously injured, but she was alive. She had a punctured lung and a shattered right femur that required surgery to insert this metal rod. And this ended up being a turning point in her life. She was so thankful to be alive, especially because in those final moments, she did not think she was going to walk away from that. She told her sister Kara that she felt born again and inspired to live the best life that she could. So she decided to take more time off of school and figure out what she truly wanted in life. And in the summer of 1999, She enrolled in a field study abroad program in Costa Rica with her friend and roommate who's named Nicole Bennett. But then three weeks before the trip, tragedy struck Leah again. Leah's dad died. And once again, she had to grieve the loss of another parent. Obviously, she had this big trip coming up to Costa Rica and she was kind of debating whether or not she should even go. But she felt like her dad would want her to go, that it would probably be good for her and Since both of her parents passed away, Leah and her siblings did inherit some money from their estate, and she decided that that's what they would want. So she went to Costa Rica with Nicole. She gave Kara the power of attorney over her finances and bank accounts while she was out of the country. And while she was away, Leah grieved the loss of her father in her own private way. Nicole never saw her crying or upset. 
Leah threw herself into the local culture and ended up having an amazing time in Costa Rica. It was really a perfect time for her to get away. And what a great place to go. Yeah. If you've never been to Costa Rica, highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's I've been there before. It was absolutely beautiful country mm-hmm. and a great place to everything is like life there is just so much simpler and just the sheer beauty of the country just like you know with the slow paced lifestyle and just yeah. like heaven on earth all around you i've actually heard of a lot of people going there to kind of heal remember my mom after my parents got divorced went to costa rica for a few weeks and it yeah. was like super healing for her yeah just to kind of breathe and good people amazing culture good food beautiful beaches i mean i mean what, what else? else can yeah. you want? Seriously. So she had a really good time out there. But when the program ended, Leah went back to school to NC State and completed her fall semester. However, that spring, she decided to drop out of school altogether, even though she was just one semester away from graduating. She wanted something just different in her life. She was tired of her routine and didn't want to live, you know, that normal track. The Go nine to, to school, five. You get know, the nine to the five. The rat race, yeah. as some would say. Yeah, she just kind of wanted to explore what else the world had to offer. And her siblings really struggled with this decision because to them, it just seemed kind of like irresponsible. She was so close to getting her degree and Leah just wasn't interested. She really could care less, honestly. So she and Nicole continued to live together, but she started pulling away from the rest of her family and friends at this time. There was enough inheritance money that she could live off of it for a while without a job. And so she never really had a set schedule and lived her life pretty spontaneously at this time. The only thing that was really tying her to her house at this time was this new kitten that she had adopted. Leah had picked up some new hobbies around this time as well, such as playing guitar. And she was also getting really into photography. She was also journaling and writing poetry about the meaning of life and hanging out in local coffee shops, just really doing a lot of soul searching. Leah wanted to be like the authors of the Beat Generation. She actually talked about taking road trips like Jack Kerouac, her favorite author. And her favorite spot was a coffee shop called Cup of Joe on Hillsborough Street in Raleigh, about a half mile from the North Carolina State's campus. It was a trendy place, but also kind of dingy. Most of the people who hung out there were smokers, including Leah. And she'd like to spend the day there just drinking coffee, you know, smoking a few cigarettes while she wrote or chatted with the locals. She also made some new friends there, including a woman named Janine Quiller. They would talk about things like finding the meaning of life through spirituality or adventure, and they bonded over their shared love of Jack Kerouac. Based on her reading material and just, you know, what people said that they talked to her about, Leah was really in this stage of life where she's just trying to figure out, like, what's her greater purpose here? She wasn't satisfied with kind of the status quo of what everybody Mm -hmm. around her were doing, her other brothers and sisters. And she really wanted to get something more out of life and just wanted to figure out how to do that and what, you know, what type of path she needed to go down. Mm -hmm. But then comes March 9th, 2000, which just seemed like an ordinary day. Leah talked to Kara on the phone that morning and they casually chatted about getting together in the near future. They didn't make any definite plans, but when Kara hung up, she assumed they'd see each other soon. There was just no indications, you know, that anything was out of the ordinary and that, You know, just another typical conversation that she had with her sister. But that afternoon, Nicole and Leah made plans to do a babysitting job together the following day. And then Nicole left for work after. When she got home that night, Leah wasn't there. Her 1993 white Jeep Cherokee was also missing. So Nicole just thought, you know, her roommate must have just gone out for something. But the next day came and Leah wasn't back yet. And Nicole assumed she'd meet her at the babysitting job but she never showed up. The following day, Saturday, March 11th, Leah was still missing. She lived by her own schedule and could come and go often, but she never stayed away for days at a time without checking in with at least Nicole. Leah's other friends and family had called the house multiple times because they hadn't heard from her or had expected to see her. Nicole didn't know what to tell them, and she had no idea where Leah could be. So this in 2000, this is like, She didn't have a cell phone, so imagine if she did, how different this case might have turned out. But, you know, you just had to rely on somebody, you know, finding a phone and then phoning the landline and Mm -hmm. hoping that person picks up. I mean, those days seem so far, far from where we're at now. Like, it's hard to even remember what that was like. Having a cell phone on someone when they disappear, or at least having it in the last location where they disappear, does normally lead to something. Yeah. So many cases, that is the... The main point that leads investigators to the next 
point, you know, well, the next evidence. Exactly. And just the mere fact that with a cell phone, you get, you can ping, you know, find yeah. out where, which tower the phone's pinging from. There's so many things you can see. And I mean, geolocation features of cell phones, mm -hmm. they have GPS. So especially nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Trackers on them. But back then, I mean, it was a lot easier to just take off and have nobody know where you went and no way to contact you. I feel like Leah, even if she, if this was now, you know, I don't think she would even want a cell phone. She was like the type of person that would be so anti being connected. She would definitely not be on social media. And I don't think she would want people to get a hold of her so quickly. She was trying to distance herself and really have disconnect from like yeah. the modern world in a way mm -hmm. and just kind of mm -hmm. like get back to basics and yeah. nature. That Monday, March 13th, Kara decided it was time to talk to the police about her sister being missing. So she went down to the Durham Police Department and filed a missing persons report. Kara then went to the house the next day and searched Leah's room with Nicole, looking for any clues that might help them figure out where she went. The first red flag to Kara was the fact that Leah's cat was gone. And obviously, Leah probably took the cat with her wherever she went. Which does mean, you know, maybe she was going to be gone. The longest you can leave a cat alone is like a day or two, you know, with food and water and litter box and everything. But maybe she was planning to be gone for a longer period of time if she took the cat with her. That's a good point. I mean, it would make sense. That, I mean, if you go and adopt a cat, you have the responsibility to take care of that cat. And, yeah. And obviously, Leah wasn't somebody who had just yeah. abandoned no. the cat for some random reason to run off and clear your head like she'd no. take the cat with her. Yeah. So then Kara went through her closet and she noticed that a lot of her clothes were gone too. So it was very clear to her almost immediately that Leah had left on her own accord and that, you know, it wasn't like she was abducted out of her house or anything like that. As far as, you know, what she could tell, it looked like she had packed her bags and there was clothes on the ground. You know, she was clearly going mm -hmm. through picking out which, which specific clothes mm -hmm. she wanted to bring with her on her trip. Which showed she was probably gonna be gone for a while. Yeah, exactly. But then they found a cryptic note on her dresser that said, I'm not suicidal. I'm the opposite. Remember Kerouac. The note wasn't left in an obvious spot as if Leah wanted someone to find it. But Kara thought it might have clues. The note seemed to imply that she planned to emulate Jack Kerouac's cross country travels, which he detailed in his novel on the road. And to Kara, this really sounded like what Leah planned to do. But eventually, you know, it all signs pointed to her returning from this road trip at some point. This is to cover bills while I'm gone. Remember, everyone is together in thoughts and prayers, and time passes quickly. Have faith in me, yourself, everyone. Leah's note said, I'm not suicidal, I'm the opposite. Remember Jack Kerouac. I think it's interesting that she specifically made the point to say, I'm not suicidal. And that's what she thought people would think because she knew people were worried about her. And obviously this reference to Jack Kerouac is, is definitely saying that she was going to try to, to do the same type of thing. And it aligns perfectly with how she'd been living her life and things that she had been saying and wanting to soul search. And right. so many people try to live this off the grid lifestyle when they're looking for the deeper meaning. Totally. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I literally just watched this National Geographic series called uh, the the Boonies. Oh, I believe so. Yeah, the Boonies, and it's about people that go that leave society, just decide one day, like I don't want to live in this oh, society yeah. anymore. You were telling me this, and it reminds me of this specific couple that had a totally normal life, house, car, regular jobs, regular people, and all of a sudden they're just like, screw all this. They sold everything, and they literally moved to the middle of the Washington state forest, which is interesting out in the middle of nowhere. And they live a hundred percent off the land. They have no money. They literally built everything from what they found in the forest they and they love the it land. and they love it. And they feel like they're free and like they're really living the way that they're meant to live. And so it's not this like totally, I mean, it's, no. it seems like a crazy idea to most, but it's more common than you think. Anyone that I've ever heard that lives even remotely like that or people that backpack around or, live in vans like yeah, van things life, i just heard like on tiktok now. and stuff i mean yeah. they always seem so happy and so well it's freeing like to, distressed it's freeing to be on the road too and just traveling to different places I'd whenever be so you want fucking stressed out though like you have to get your own dinner you'd like get a 
people make sure love you that, find though. firewood what people if it rains that. what if you get bit by r- ants like that's wow. part of the fun well the- i am a child of the modern times because <laughs> i don't think i could handle no it. van life for there's you, no huh? way i'd be okay. thinking about like you know soul searching or maybe i could i don't know Maybe I could. If you're Maybe going, well, after if you're, a certain amount of time, you like get used to the life, and yeah, I yeah. could see how it could be very deep. It could be a very a very beneficial experience. Well, and you've got you, she has this guide essentially from Jack Kerouac. I mean, he literally did this, and so mm-hmm. she's kind of literally retracing his footsteps. One of her favorite books of his was Dharma Bums, and it's really about like finding spirituality and like really you know it's got a lot of buddhist sort of principles in it that it teaches and a lot of it is about going to these beautiful places and sort of that's where you find you know spirit you know you reconnect with spirit which honestly Mm -hmm. i kind of agree like that's a great place to go and at least bond with mother nature and like really try to like figure out who you are there's no distractions to like get you you know there's nothing to like you know distract you from like what's real and like what's right What's, you're in the natural world exactly your reality is what is in front of you you Absolutely. get to live more in the moment versus planning your next step and getting ready for work the next day and someone's calling you with something stressful i mean i could i get it you well could especially be, yeah or you're by yourself mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and who who's there to talk you know it's just you and the universe i would much. go crazy i hate being alone i hate being alone <laughs> like do. i can't be alone and even when I am alone, I have to have like a podcast on or something to make me not feel right, alone. Right. You don't like to just listen to like nature, or the wind. Or... I mean, I do for like two minutes and then I get stressed out. My anxiety starts, you know, intrusive thoughts start to enter. Yeah. I need a distraction for my brain. Not Leah, though. She was like, yeah. screw it. You know? I mean, it, Leah had been through a lot at this point. Oh, like, yeah. I'm I would have sure done the same there thing. So much for her to think about losing both of your parents. And just like realizing, I think when you go through something like that, you really, it really does give you a new perspective on how short life is and how every moment is not guaranteed. Like we, we have to, it forces you to live in the here and now versus so many people live in like the future where they're like, oh, you know, this, this and that. But then what they're doing currently is completely, you know, nonsense compared to what they should be doing. You know, like they're just kind of living in this always in this future mindset which it's really easy to get stuck in that it's almost impossible for me to pull myself out of thinking about the future like even while i'm getting a massage i'm like thinking about afterwards what i need to do for work or like the night before i'm you know i never have a moment where i just live in the in the actual moment and embrace what's around me it's so rare for me and so difficult to do and it's because we have so many distractions around us all the time and work and our yeah. pets and you know people have kids and well and it's way worse now than it was like in the early 2000s because we're yeah. so connected yeah i mean we have it's shit bad. we have technology everywhere you know it's really pockets bad. our wrists mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on billboards i mean it's everywhere yeah, dude, i got three devices just sitting right in front of me <laughs> it's overload honestly it's really so bad. you yeah. know that that's like what the ancients taught is like you got to go back to like the origins of you know our story and that is us and the planet and just Mm. get into nature and and leave all that behind like Mm -hmm. you know that's why there's there's hotels and resorts that literally will like have no cell phone service no wi-fi no nothing or they'll even like collect your phone and you're it's just you that sounds nice well my phone broke on our vacation so it was kind of (laughs) nice kind of the same thing but then you have an (laughs) ipad so you can just i know i message on your ipad when i had wi-fi yeah (laughs) And that's the thing. It's like we're all so connected. So, that's bad. you know, but I totally see why Leah was like, mm-hmm. this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I've been through enough and it's time for me to really figure out how I want to spend my life because it could end at any point. So Leah had asked Nicole to go on a trip like this with her in the past. But Nicole always said no because she had school. She had a job. She felt like she couldn't just leave all that behind and go off with her for several weeks. But one interesting thing about this note that they found is it had this little drawing of the Cheshire cat grin. I don't think it was the whole cat. It was just the grin from Alice in Wonderland. And if, you know, if you've seen Alice in Wonderland, you know, this character. I don't really remember it. Can you of, refresh my memory on the. You don't remember the no, Cheshire cat? No, I haven't cat? seen Alice in Wonderland in, in probably like 20 years. 
Bro, <laughs> I'm we serious. gotta watch it. I know, and they made a new well, one. I know Isn't what we're there doing a tonight? new one too? Yeah, it's probably one of those fucking animate like re like with. People. But I think it's got like we got Johnny Depp the cartoon. in it or something. Well, something. who cares? Those ones always suck. Oh. I like the cartoons. The real ones. The we need to watch the real Alice in Wonderland. But the Cheshire Cat is kind of this mischievous character. It's like you don't fully know the intentions. Like it's, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's kind of like a, a trickster. And it kind of pops in and out when it wants to, Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't like, you know, it's not just there the whole time. No. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It would just kind of show up. It's kind of interesting that she put this too, because obviously Alice in Wonderland is associated with psychedelics and everything. So it kind of makes you wonder if she was at all dabbling into that. I mean, with everything else she was talking about in her life, it kind of makes you think maybe, maybe she was thinking. She was out there thinking and having you know having, having some, some help with that yeah. which you know i have no that's completely just my speculation you know, yeah there's, there's no, no proof of that exactly. at all but i just thought it was interesting that she put that but it was kind of interesting to kara because it was a smile so it kind of seemed like she was going to come back you know i mean who would put a big smiling face on their goodbye letter and just the fact that the actual character pops in and out so yeah. she thought like maybe she'll disappear for a bit but then maybe and it's kind of a trick she'll be back yeah. you don't know where i am blah 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 well, yeah well just the fact that leah wrote kind of like a cryptic note in the first place just mm-hmm. kind of lends you know itself to that explanation i feel like that it was kind of you know i want to kind of keep my family like in this shroud yeah. of mystery of kind of what right. i'm doing because she could have just been like, I'm going to go here. Here's the address. Here's the phone number. You right. can call, you know, you can reach me here in an emergency. Like she didn't do any of that. She just, mm-hmm. she left like these little like clues that really don't point anywhere in particular, but other than I'm going to be gone for a bit mm-hmm. and maybe I'll be back. Maybe I won't. Maybe it wasn't even the Cheshire cat. Like looking at it now. I think it was. You it think was, it was? Yeah. Cause look at the grin. That's the grin. The, yeah. Look at the, yeah. It's the yeah. Yeah. Grin. I see that. Yeah. I just thought maybe she was like inspired by her cat or something and just drew a smile. Her like cat this. smiles like that? I don't know. Why not draw the eyes and stuff too? I don't know. Kind of strange. Yeah. But yeah, it didn't seem like a goodbye letter. It seemed like no. a see you later. So they also found a wad of cash to cover her share of the rent and other expenses for her roommate for the next month, which seemed like she'd be coming back as well. You know, she didn't say she she wouldn't screw over her roommate like that, you know? So the investigation continued with Leah's bank accounts. Kara still had power of attorney and found out that Leah had withdrawn about $3,000 on March 9th after their phone call. And that night, she paid for a hotel room in Memphis, Tennessee with her debit card. Kara tracked the gas and food purchases along Interstate 40 as Leah drove west. She reached California and then headed north on Interstate 5. She bought gas in Brooks, Oregon, Around midnight on Monday, March 13th, the day Kara reported her missing to the police. But after that, she completely stops using her accounts. There was no more purchases made on her debit card, and there was no other cash withdrawals either. Of course, we can't track whatever else she was spending out of that 3000 she had. But, I mean, there was nothing digital after that point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting because, I mean, clearly, maybe it was just because of the location she's in. She's kind of going through more remote stretches of of highway. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it's really it's really interesting that, and I think the bill for the gas was like $20 in gas or something. Yeah. Which she's driving a Jeep Cherokee, and, you know, those aren't like super gas efficient. Right. So I'm one, she was kind of like going, like, I don't even think that maybe in 2000, that was enough to fill the tank. It probably was with gas prices back yeah, then. Yeah, I was going to say. She only spent twenty dollars total the entire total, trip? Though. No, just, just on, on that gas. On that particular stop. Mm-hmm. She put $20 of gas in there. And maybe that's enough to actually fill the tank in 2000. But I don't know. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Like, it was like she was I don't think had so. these planned stops uh, or something. I don't know. Maybe. Okay. So the actual cost of gas per gallon around 2000 was a dollar and 51 cents so yeah i mean yeah easily could have covered the bill then god mm-hmm. gas has gone up so much Jesus. yeah it's crazy it's like four times as much now so Kara enlisted the help of leah's best friend Susie smith to help her try to investigate they talked to janine one of her newest friends that she hung out with at cup of joe and they hoped that leah had mentioned something to janine about this trip that she was going to go on to the pacific northwest Leah and Janine had talked about poetry and travel. 
They had many conversations about Jack Kerouac's lesser known sequel to On the Road, which was the novel that you had mentioned, Dharma Bums. From the last conversation that we had, we were talking about Dharma Bums. She was talking about wanting to go up on Desolation Peak and how she really wanted to go off by herself and figure a lot of things out and figure out what kind of person she wanted to be because she really didn't know anymore. In this story, Kerouac details the inspirational beauty he found in the Northern Cascade Mountains in Washington State. He actually worked as a Forest Service fire lookout on Desolation Peak and spent 63 days there in the summer of 1956. That's actually really cool to think about. It'd be very a little bit lonesome up there for 63 days, yeah. just sitting up on like one of those lookouts on top of the mountain looking for forest I fires. I would go crazy. <laughs> There's no way. But Desolation Peak Trail actually is a steep, strenuous hike known for stunning views of Ross Lake and snowy mountain peaks. And most people make the hike in the summer months because if you try to go in the winter, it's going to be a tough time. Very cold, lots of snow. This was really good news to Kara, though. If Leah was tackling Desolation Peak Trail, she wouldn't be using her debit card or withdrawing cash. Maybe she even planned to do the 63-day trip to experience the Cascade Mountains just as her favorite author, Kerouac, had done decades before. But unfortunately, Kara's relief was short-lived. Days after talking to Janine, Kara celebrated her 26th birthday on March 18, 2000. She expected Leah to call her, assuming she could get access to a phone on her trip, but she didn't call. That day, Kara heard from the Durham police that Leah's Jeep had been found abandoned in Bellingham, Washington. It was found early that morning by a couple running on Canyon Creek Road. They're just going along and they notice articles of clothing along the road hanging up in branches on the trees. Canyon Creek Road, just for reference, is off of Mount Baker Highway near Mount Baker National Forest. And it's a remote area close to the Canadian border. It's sparsely populated with just a few residents and logging camps, which are work sites for the logging industry. The only vehicles usually on the road were logging trucks, and few locals ever used it. And someone passing through town would have no reason to be there. The clothes that were found were spread near a curve at the top of a slope. And over the side of a steep ridge looking down into the forest, the couple saw the Jeep. But there was no signs of Leah anywhere. So this is where the investigation really sort of picks up because now we have Leah's missing vehicle, but no Leah. So before we dive into that more, we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be right back. Remember the feeling you got as a kid of getting tucked into bed or the feeling you get now in the arms of somebody you love? Safe and secure is how you probably feel. It's a feeling of security that only comes through a human connection. And that's why the people at Simply Safe Home Security are so important. The thing that I love about Simply Safe Security is the fact that they make security monitoring for everyone, pretty much. Like it's all prices and it doesn't matter how big your space is. You could have a one bedroom apartment and still get Simply Safe for a very affordable price, all the way up to businesses and houses. And honestly, it's the easiest system I've ever used. And technologically, it's the most advanced. It's also the reason why I switched from the, the big security company, you we all know which one that is, in order to use Simply Safe, and I'm never going back. Simply Safe has an award-winning system that has all the technology bells and whistles. You'd expect these days, we're talking apps, we're talking cameras, all that good stuff. But the people at Simply Safe really take it to the next level. They're there all around the clock anytime you need them. And the thing is, Simply Safe just makes it super easy for everybody. It takes about two minutes to customize a system on their website at simplysafe.com slash milehire. Definitely check it out because you might actually be surprised at how affordable security monitoring could be for you and your home. Whether it's a fire, a burglary, a medical emergency, a burst pipe, or even a problem while you're setting up the system, Simply Safe has a person with the expertise you need ready to help 24 seven. And when you know there's always someone there to help, well, that's a feeling you just don't get with any old security system. To learn more about how Simply Safe can help protect you and your family, visit simplysafe.com slash milehire today to customize your system and get a free security camera, which is a really good deal. You also get a 60 day risk-free trial so you can try it out and if you don't like it, then great. Or if you love it, even better. So there's nothing to lose with this offer. That's simplysafe.com slash milehire. Today's episode is sponsored by Care Of. I'm a big fan of Care Of because it makes taking your vitamins so, so easy. You really don't even have to think about it. Care Of's products are formulated with good for you, clean ingredients that are backed by science. And Care Of is super transparent about the research and sourcing behind each of their products. 
And their recommendations come in a daily individual wrapped packet, which is amazing. That's my favorite part of Care of is how easy it is to take them. Like if you're going to be going away for a couple nights, you can grab, you know, three or four, whatever you need, put them in your bag and you don't have to bring a bunch of different bottles. You don't have to get out your pill pack and put all their vitamins into the daily things. I just absolutely hate that. So it makes it so easy to just grab one of these little packs and take everything in it. Studies show that it can take 30 days for you to see benefits after a new supplement routine. So consistency with vitamins is key. And Care Of makes it easy with a personalized subscription delivered right to your door each month, contact free, of course, so that you do not have to worry about running out. And the Care Of app allows you to track your routine and earn rewards like cool swag, discounts, and even free products when you're consistent with taking your vitamins. And if you're new to vitamins, it's really easy to figure out what you may benefit from with Care Of's in-depth online quiz, which asks you questions about your diet, lifestyle, and health concerns to help address specific wellness goals. Care Of's holistic online quiz is like getting a one-on-one consultation with a nutritionist without even leaving your house. So if you guys want to check out Care Of, you can actually get 50% off your first order if you go to TakeCareOf.com and enter promo code MileHire50. That's TakeCareOf.com and enter promo code MileHire50 for 50% off your first Care Of order. So just recently, I got back from a little vacation down to Mexico and I brought my Raycon E25 wireless earbuds with me. And I'm so thankful I did because it made my trip so much more enjoyable, especially those airplane rides. I mean, nobody wants to listen to what everybody's talking about or just the noise, the baby crying in the back or the terrible movie they've got on. Well, with my wireless earbuds from Raycon, I can shut all that out and go into my own little piece of heaven, whether that's my music, podcasts, or recently I was watching, rewatching the Conjuring series. So they really came in clutch for my trip. Raycon's my favorite wireless earbuds because they give you tons of sound and beautiful bass with earbuds that are half the cost as some of the premium brands out there, which is uh, absolutely amazing for your ears and your wallet. And Raycons are built to go wherever you go. They've got quick seamless Bluetooth pairing and a compact charging case. So you know you've always got them charged up, ready to go when you need them. So listen up, Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for my listeners, and here's what you've got to do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash mile higher, and there you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order, which is a super good deal. You'll want to grab a pair and a spare because they also have like over your headphones and a bunch of other options, different colors. It's really cool stuff. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash mile higher, buyraycon.com slash mile higher. So Leah's car was just found by the couple, and now the Washington State Patrol is responding to the scene to check it out. They were quickly able to match the license plate on the Jeep to Leah Roberts, and they found out that a missing person report had actually been filed for her in North Carolina. Obviously, having North Carolina plates on the vehicle, that made it very easy for them to kind of connect the dots. But they believed her Jeep went off the road and down the slope going about 30 to 40 miles per hour. Basically, they assessed this from looking at the damage to the surrounding trees as well as to the Jeep itself, and both were pretty significantly damaged. And the damage in the way the items inside were tossed all around and outside of the vehicle basically led them to believe that the Jeep had likely rolled over multiple times as it landed at the bottom of this ravine. But what was strange is there was no sign of any blood or any marks in the car or any you know, bumps into the steering wheel or a crack into the windshield, any evidence that someone had been in the vehicle when it crashed. No sign that someone was injured. Which would be basically impossible Yeah, for somebody to walk out of that completely unscathed with no evidence of that person being in the wreck. It's almost like no one was in the car. That's what it seems like. When it was rolled off. Yeah. The steering wheel wasn't damaged at all. The seatbelt wasn't even stretched out. The windows were smashed, but none of them were damaged from the inside. These are all the things that investigators would expect to see if someone had been sitting in the driver's seat at the time of the crash. Well, with the speed that the vehicle was traveling and the amount of damage to the vehicle, you would anticipate some type of injury uh, to the person inside. If there was no injury to the person inside, at least some type of evidence to indicate contact damage that the person had been inside the vehicle. Um, None of those signs were evident. There was also no evidence to explain how the Jeep could have run off the road at that speed if no one was inside of it. Um, There's nothing to indicate the wheel was tied and then it was pushed off the road. We couldn't find any uh, marks on the back that indicate anybody had pushed it to where it was. Um, If you had somebody driving the vehicle and they jumped out, 
you could have taken your life into your own hands trying to jump out of the vehicle at that speed. That's crazy. I mean, think about being those officers coming to that realization. They're like, oh, nobody was driving this. Yeah. How did it just fly off? You know, how I don't even not know how. And it's not does like that. it could have picked up that much speed. I mean, maybe it could have down the hill, though, you know, picked up enough speed well, that I mean, it would do more damage. Yeah. Or like something was put on the, the acceleration pedal and then it just like. You know, like wheeled it out or jumped took out off. before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's ways to do it, I guess, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. but. So they thought maybe Leah was in the car and, you know, got a head injury and just wandered off and was lost and confused. So they checked local hospitals, but no one matching Leah's description had come in with any injuries from a car accident. Inside the Jeep, they found Leah's driver's license, her checkbook and her passport, which are all items that she would need if she was going to run away. Yeah. Nobody would leave without those. Even no. if you were in a wreck like that, you would stay with it and make sure you recover yeah. that. She also left behind a lot of her clothes and her possessions, like her CDs and her guitar. But there was cat food and a cat carrier inside the Jeep, meaning she had her kitten with her. There were no reports of a stray kitten in the area at the time. And the kitten to this day has also never been found. Which is very interesting and kind of spooky, honestly. I know. Because my thought was like, well, if, I mean, a kitten getting wrecked in a car like that probably would not survive it even in a kennel, you know? So you would expect to, you You'd know, see something blood right. or yeah, which would suggest that the kitten was also not in the vehicle prior to the crash. Yeah. Cause I mean, you would either find the kitten dead in the vehicle or it would have somehow climbed out and was probably be nearby. And well, that's possible too. It could have climbed out one of the windows, but yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's really eerie, strange though, but know? it's a kitten so it's not it's not going to go very far right. right especially it being like a domesticated cat i mean they're not going to right. they're not going to go into the into the what into the into forest, the forest yeah. and do what <laughs> yeah i mean maybe but i feel i agree in most cases a scared little kitten would probably stay near the scene and be like crying it seems like the cat was with her or with someone else so investigators didn't suspect a robbery because valuable jewelry and twenty five hundred dollars in cash were left behind and this money was in a pocket and a pair of pants, so it wasn't hidden at all. And that's a lot of cash to just leave behind. Right. Like if she's trying to stage like something happened and maybe leave all of her personal belongings behind right. on purpose because she doesn't want to be found. She wants to start a new identity. She doesn't want to be tracked in any way. You'd at least grab the cash, right? Everybody needs cash. Doesn't right? matter where you're going or. There's no fucking way she would just leave that. You need that to survive. I mean, mm -hmm. but then again, I'm, I'm telling you, these people from the, the boonies, they left all their cash behind too because where they mm -hmm. were going doesn't matter. Cash doesn't show. matter. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. And I guess they're kind of disgusted by money altogether in the first place. Yeah. But I don't know. She took the cash out. You know. How are you going to buy more food for your kid? Right. What is she going to do? So the money was in the pocket of her pair of pants, like we said. So it was just out in the open. Someone totally could have seen it. And what's really weird is there were blankets and pillows hung inside of the car to cover the smashed windows. It kind of looked like someone was staying in the vehicle as like a makeshift shelter after the crash had already happened. That's really weird. I know. Uh, or, or it's possible like they like some before you know the actual crash happened they were already in the windows i mean some of them are like kind of pressed up in between the cracks like whoever put these into the windows kind of like lodged them in there so they would stay in place you know mm -hmm. by I having the door saying. kind of hit part of it so my thought is maybe potentially you know she got stranded in her car her jeep or maybe and she's for a sleeping while. in the car or like blocking out the sunlight. Yeah, blankets. exactly. That's what I'm saying is prior to it prior. running off the road for whatever reason, she was actually living in the vehicle for some time or for whatever reason. But it looked like to investigators that this stuff was set up after the crash had already happened. Yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to say. We can't actually see the I crime wasn't scene. I wasn't in the thing, so I, I can't yeah. really say. But that's just one thought that I had. Mm -hmm. Like maybe, it, yeah. is it possible that this was all put in place before the vehicle went down into the ravine it's possible so because leah had crossed state lines the fbi joined the case almost immediately and the jeep was towed to a police garage and when examining it more closely they found evidence that she may have been the victim of a crime she would have been in bellingham for several days between the last time that she used her debit card and the crash but she still had most of the money that she had withdrawn from her account 
So investigators knew something may have happened to Leah shortly after she arrived. And then someone else had her Jeep and eventually crashed it. Luckily, Leah had saved some things like receipts and ticket stubs, and they were in a box inside the Jeep, which helped the police put together her movements on March 13th. The fact that she was saving things from her trip made it more likely that she was planning to return home and show off what she had done during her travels. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear Mm -hmm. here is that her plan was to return at some point. Yeah, it really seems like it. There was surveillance footage from the gas station in Oregon where she used her debit card last. She was alone and she looked fine, but she glanced out at the parking lot several times, which they thought was odd. But it could also been just to check on her kitten, like maybe yeah. her kitten was just in the car and Possibly. like, or the window was rolled down or something, or there was someone with her. There's somebody or waiting or for her. sketching her out or something. You mm-hmm. don't know. Mm-hmm. Because of course, at this gas station, there was absolutely no security cameras on the outside. Yeah. Just on the inside. So obviously investigators thought it was possible she was traveling with someone else and she was looking out at them in the parking lot. But the Jeep didn't show any evidence of another passenger with her. And after buying gas in Oregon, she drove five or six hours to Bellingham. And that afternoon, she went to an afternoon showing of American Beauty at a theater in Bellis Fair, which is an indoor mall. There was no evidence that Leah had stayed in a hotel since March 9th, the day after she left North Carolina. Kara and their brother, Heath, flew to Washington right away to meet with investigators. They were both worried sick at this point. They went to the crash site and they looked through everything that was found inside of her Jeep, hoping that they could shed some light on what had happened. But after looking at the crash site and the Jeep, Heath believed that Leah could have walked away from the accident unharmed. But police disagreed. But then they found something really important. And I think this is one of the most important pieces of this case is investigators found an engagement ring under one of the floor mats. And this ring belonged to Leah's mother. And Leah wore it every day. She literally never took this ring off. It meant the world to her. It was her most important possession. As long as I've known Leah, she has worn her mother's engagement ring. It was her most prized possession. And when we discovered that the ring had been found in the car, it was kind of a bad sign. There is no way that she would have left that behind and purposely left that car. Like the cash, you can kind of argue, maybe she didn't like money, whatever. But the engagement ring, why would she leave a piece of her mom, such an important piece of her mom? If she was going to leave and she didn't want that ring with her for some reason, she would have left that with, with another one of her siblings, for sure. Right. I mean, that just shows more than anything, I think, that she did not voluntarily leave the car. I agree. I think it's hard to argue the other way. Mm -hmm. I think... I think it would have been a different story if like she had made the little note and like maybe attached the ring to it. Right. That would have been completely different. But if it was so special to her. Yeah. Then, you know, then just that's... leave it in your car under a floor mat. Right. Right. No, something that she wore every day, her, her piece of her mother that she carried with her. There's just no way she would have left that. Her siblings knew that this ring was so important to her that the only way she would have taken it off is if she was forced to or if she literally forgot who she was. You know, if she had hit her head in the accident and taken it off and just didn't know what it was because she was confused. Yeah, yeah. Or someone forced her to take it off. Which is the more likely scenario. I mean, there's no evidence of her being in the wreck, so then you start leaning towards someone forced her, you know, either out of the vehicle or to take that off. But, Mm -hmm. I mean, people do get amnesia and, you know, completely forget who they are and... Yeah, it does happen. And when you find, you know, a car abandoned and there's a missing person, that is obviously one of the more likely scenarios that they got some type of head trauma and they're confused and walking around. It happens all the time. So Kara and Heath made flyers of Leah's picture and posted them around town, hoping that someone might recognize her. They went to all the local businesses that she may have visited and talked with owners, workers, and customers. Someone had to have some information about what she was doing that day or who she may have been with. There was only one restaurant in the mall where she could have sat down for a meal, and the employees remembered her sitting at the counter to eat that day. Then the police tracked down two men who had been at the same restaurant that afternoon and claimed that they had actually talked to Leah. The men had sat down on either side of her at the counter, and she talked about her trip and how she wanted to explore the country just like Jack Kerouac. She was excited and very open. They said it was a really pleasant conversation. One of these witnesses told investigators that Leah was with a man named Barry. 
Leah greeted Barry by name when he came into the restaurant, and they eventually left together. And just for clarity, she spoke to only one of the individuals that sat next to her in the restaurant because they were, you know, the flyers were like calling tips. And mm-hmm. so he called in a tip to police saying that, you know, this was the, my experience with her. And then obviously reported that this other guy was Barry. But that was kind of the full extent of what he knew as far as what he told police. Mm-hmm. I mean, there could be more. He There could be more of a connection there. We just don't know. The man that called in the tip was actually able to describe this so-called Barry extremely well to the point that the police actually created a sketch of the guy and the sketch of the guy i mean he looks like a i don't know well how would you describe his description how would i describe his description yeah i mean pretty looks like a he's little got, like clint eastwoody looks like he's got gauges or a earring on one yeah at ear. least one earring on one ear yeah um very chiseled face yeah he looks younger too I mean, mugshot or uh, composites always look kind of scary, but he does look freaky. That's true. He does look kind of creepy for sure. Really thin lips, kind of beady eyes. But while Karen and Heath were in town, they talked to anyone who would listen and showed Leah's picture to hundreds of people before finally returning home four days after they arrived. A few days after the Jeep was towed away, an anonymous man called the police, and he claimed that his wife had spotted Leah around a Texaco gas station in Everett, Washington, which is about 30 miles north of Seattle. Apparently, Leah was wandering around alone, and she seemed confused about her surroundings and didn't know who she was. But when police tried to get more information, the man panicked and hung up. He didn't give his name or his wife's name, but investigators thought that the tip was credible. And for the next two weeks, the police searched the area around the crash site. They believe Leah might have suffered a head injury in the accident and just wandered away disoriented, maybe with amnesia. The authorities had helicopters brought in to fly over the forest to see if they could spot anything. They also had search parties with dogs to track her scent or even detect human remains. And even metal detectors were brought in to hopefully locate the metal rod in Leah's leg if they were looking for remains. But after all these search efforts, they didn't find anything at all. And there is absolutely no trace of her. She literally vanished into thin air. But then... After some, you know, some breaks in the media, we start to get a few more new developments. Before we get into those, we're going to take one more break and we'll be right back. Guys, it's 2021 and nobody has time for uncomfortable shoes. That's where Rothy's come in. Rothy's has surveyed thousands of customers and the number one word used to describe their shoe is comfy. And that's truly how I would describe it. I love my Rothy's. And what makes Rothy so good, you might be wondering, is their unique seamless design that's insanely comfortable the moment that you put them on. And their styles are sustainably made with materials like plastic water bottles. And they're fully machine washable, which is so helpful if you're klutzy like me, you spill stuff on your shoes, you can literally just throw them in the wash and they're not going to get ruined in any way. Rothy's are available in tons of shapes, styles, and colors, so you can always find the right shoe for you. And what I love about Rothy's is there is no break-in period. I hate when I get a new pair of shoes and I have to wear them around and go through that uncomfortable stage, but that is not even a thing with Rothy's. They are just purely comfortable as soon as you put them on. And Pop Sugar named Rothy's one of the most comfortable and cute flats that you'll never tire of wearing. And I totally agree with that. So upgrade your closet with the washable, sustainable, stylish shoes and bags from Rothy's. Plus, they just launched men's shoes as well, so make sure to check them out for you or the guy in your life. All you gotta do is head to rothys.com slash milehigher to find your new favorites today. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash milehigher. If your life is busy or your schedule from day to day always changes, or you know you just can't find the time you need to plan out the menu for the week, go to the grocery store, gather up the ingredients you need in order to make those meals, and then come home and actually prepare and cook the meals. Well, you're not alone. That is me pretty much every single week. And it's always a huge relief when I know that I've got HelloFresh backing me up with the ingredients I need to make three or four delicious home-cooked meals with everything, all of the legwork already done. So all the prep work, all the ingredients are all fresh, ready to go, exactly what I need for the recipe and the serving size that I need. Because in the past, I'd go to the grocery store, spend way too much money on ingredients, come home and cook enough food for a freaking army so now i can actually just get the food and ingredients i need to make enough for kendall and myself and it makes it super easy it's way cheaper actually save money with hell fresh 
And best of all, HelloFresh has all sorts of different types of recipes, all types of cuisines, and it actually helps you learn how to cook, which I really love. I actually love making the chicken ramen from HelloFresh. It's one of my favorite recipes. And I gotta say, they never let you down. It's always on time and you can stop, start whenever you want, which is super convenient. And HelloFresh is out there trying to save the planet all at the same time. So stop going to the grocery store today and instead go online to hellofresh.com slash milehire12 and then make sure you use code milehire12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. I mean, what a deal is that? Go to hellofresh.com slash milehire12 today and use code milehire12 and you'll get 12 free meals and free shipping. Plus, you'll support the show. So Leah's story was featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries in 2001, but none of the tips that came in from the show led anywhere. It was still completely cold. Meanwhile, Kara started working with a woman named Monica Kaysen, who specializes in keeping missing persons cases that have gone cold in the media, in the front of the public to help generate new leads. Monica is the founder of the Community of United Effort, CUE, for Center for the Missing. And she does all her work on a volunteer basis. In 2004, Monica and her volunteer network organized a cross-country caravan to spotlight the case. Here's a clip of Monica explaining. Her case got little attention until we decided to do was sit down with the authorities and we came up with her credit card statements, which she had used the whole entire way. Um, and we decided we were going to go to every place that she stopped, put up posters, bring a renewal to, her, to the effort of looking for her, let people know she was missing. They traveled from North Carolina to Washington, following the same route that Leah did four years earlier. It was a 14 day trip that raised awareness for Leah's case and 60 additional missing persons cases along the way. Some of these cases never got more than a three inch column in a newspaper with no photo. Um, some of these cases um, have, have not had a story in seven or eight years. Maybe they've been missing 15 years and we're gonna keep working their cases. And I do believe that every case is solvable. You just have to spend time and you have to, to really just continue to work on it. This event has continued every year to raise awareness about Leah's disappearance and other missing persons cases around the country. It's called the Road to Remember Tour, and Kara continues to be involved in organizing it. Also in 2005, Monica and Kara went on the Larry King live show to make sure that no one forgot about Leah. Kara has done multiple media interviews. She has tried everything she can to keep her sister's name out there. She has talked about how hard it was to lose both of their parents in such a short period of time and how Leah had been going through so much in the years leading up to her disappearance. And just poor Kara, like to lose your little sister like that and and her brother, like uh, God, like to lose your parents and then lose your little sister without explanation too. Yeah. That's the worst because you just have no way to to get closure. Like how do you even, how do you even begin to heal? Well, it's like we, you know, we sit here and talk about theories and possibilities of what happened to her. Imagine being that family member where literally that just is playing through your head every single day, all day. And how can it not? Yeah, how can it not? Exactly. So in 2006, the lead detective on the case handed the files over to two younger detectives, and they decided to go over all the evidence again and see if anything had been missed, which happens all the time. And when they looked in the case notes, they realized that no one had ever looked under the hood of Leah's Jeep. Come on. Like they did a full, you know, analysis of the Jeep initially. They pulled everything out. Mm Mm-hmm. And yet they were already throwing around the idea that most likely this went off the road without somebody in it. Why did they not think, oh, maybe we should take a look to see if somebody rigged the yeah. actual car itself. Look at the engine. Look at look every at- fucking inch of the car. I mean, it makes no sense. And Kara had asked the police department to hang on to the car during all Which, of this time. Smart on her part. Seriously. Like, I feel like most people wouldn't even think to like, have, yeah. you know, keep the car. They assumed the police had already done everything right. they can with the car. And there's no point to even keep it anymore. Yeah, that's what you'd like to assume. But oftentimes it's just sitting there. So in all those years, she could have had it and been running her own tests and had private investigators looking at it. But she, you know, you want to trust that the police are going to be doing everything that they can. So the detectives finally decide to pop the hood up and they discovered that the car had been tampered with. Yeah, like very quickly, too. It was like very obvious the car had been tampered with. Literally a wire to the starter relay had been cut. This would allow the vehicle to continuously accelerate, even if no one was pushing the gas pedal, which meant that this accident was likely staged. This would have been helpful information for them to have known 
literally they could have figured this out at the crime scene. Yep. They could have just popped the hood and figured it out right away. You would think that they would do that. Especially especially you know, when they're sitting there scratching their heads about how how did the car possibly go 40 miles an yeah, hour when no yeah. one was clearly in it? And they have all these questions. Why not that never fucking popped look at in the their car? head? Like pop the hood at least. Just look at the engine. Yeah. Make sure it's not like See a faulty engine part or something. Right. Like you'd think it'd be basic investigation skills to think maybe someone tampered with the car and, and forced it to crash. And that's why there's no evidence of anyone in the car. That's just, and that's how it, it was moving so quickly. That's oh, a major that's bonehead so frustrating. mistake right there. Oh, imagine like, oh, it's like one little mistake like that, but that is I'd be so earth pissed. shattering for the I'd family. I'd be so pissed if I was oh my God. I'd be lighting these detectives up. Be like, are you kidding me? I'd be so mad. You even bother to look at the engine for an unknown vehicle crash? Like, what? And get this. It gets even worse. They also found a fingerprint under the hood, along with male DNA on Leah's clothing. Wow. Fingerprint under the hood. That would have been probably way better and easier to, you know, look at and analyze years ago. Yeah. I mean, pulling a print years later is probably not going to be as good as a fresh print, you know, from mm -hmm. a couple days potentially. So now they know there's foul play and it's there's probably a male involved. So that leaves them with this suspicious guy who brought up you know, had, how he had talked to Leah, had this great conversation with her. And there's this other dude named Barry there, but no one has ever seen Barry. No one's ever heard of Barry. No other witnesses saw her leaving with anyone else. So that makes that guy look incredibly suspicious. Yeah. And I was just thinking too, the fact that it, because it just reminded me of this case you recently covered where, you know, somebody who commits a crime, you know, make sure they have a solid alibi and, and oh, a person yeah. to commit the crime and they give the perfect description almost too perfect yep. and i feel like that's exactly what the whoever this guy what whoever this guy is did when he told the police tried to yeah tried and, the, to. and that could have been another i wonder if the police were like oh red flag this guy happened to be like staring at this guy to get his details down so perfectly like that and it's such a common thing for criminals to actually call you know, tip lines and try to it is. give information yeah. and they think it like helps yeah. keep them under the radar. Right. So this witness was actually a mechanic with a military background and he could have easily tampered with Leah's Jeep. He would have had the knowledge for sure. Yes. Both from being in the military and just being a mechanic. I mm -hmm. mean, cause w the actual things that were done to her vehicle are beyond like the knowledge of like, just the average. The average. like I wouldn't know, if somebody was like, hey, Josh, you know, make this car accelerate without <laughs> pressing the gas pedal, I'd be like, OK, let me get a brick or something and put it on top of it. <laughs> I wouldn't know to go into like the engine and like find the little starter yeah, wire. And, yeah, like, yeah. I'd be too scared. I'd like shock myself or something. Yeah, it's you know, definitely someone who knew, knows what they were doing for sure. And this guy happened to be. So this guy was living in Canada and it took a long time for them to track him down. And then once they did, they got his fingerprints and DNA to compare. This man to this day has remained anonymous, but he has posted comments online that he was treated poorly by the police and the media. He said that he was interviewed by investigators for 12 hours and passed two lie detector tests, but that they refused to believe him and continued to accuse him of lying and hurting Leah. He was accused of fleeing the country and moving to Canada after Leah's disappearance, but he said that he is a Canadian and he's always lived in Canada. In March of 2000, he was in Washington state to visit his sons who lived just a few miles away from the border in Bellingham. He also claimed that he hasn't been back to the U.S. to visit his sons because he thinks that he might be arrested for a crime that he has nothing to do with. It's a little, mm, yeah. It's a little fishy. Yeah, it's definitely a little paranoia there. And why why even bother going online and like fighting with people yeah. and like, writing comments why not just like right really disappear because he was the only witness he said he was afraid of being the scapegoat for investigators who just wanted to say that the case had been solved at the end of the day which i get i do get that to some extent because mm -hmm. and there are a lot of cases where it does happen. they grab whoever's the most you know they want to get justice for the victim they want to close the case mm -hmm. and give the family some answers and and of course we don't know this is the only possible suspect i mean is there a chance there really was a man named Barry? Maybe. Is there another unknown person we don't no know about? No one else remembers seeing it, though. Like I know. I know. I'm just I'm saying, like, mm, like yeah. you can't at the end of the day say that this guy 100% did it. There's just not enough information. No, but no. he is surely the most suspicious 
So he has fully cooperated with the police as far as we know, and he has provided his fingerprints and DNA. His fingerprint actually wasn't a match, which is interesting. And if the police got the results from a DNA test, they have not released that information to the public as of now. This man said that he requested that they dispose of his DNA after testing it against what was found on Leah's clothes, but claims that they refused, which keeps him linked to the case. That's a very strange request for them to trash his DNA. Yeah. What? Yeah. Why? Why do you care? I can see both both ways on why you'd want your, you know, some people just don't want their DNA held by the police because. Because maybe you commit crimes. You don't want them maybe, to connect you to yeah, some other or, shit. Or you're scared of being wrongfully accused of a crime, yeah, which is a legitimate could, fear. Could go either way there. Yeah. So the police are convinced that their best chance of finding Leah is to continue to focus on the area where the Jeep was found. There have been multiple additional searches in that forest, but still to this day, no trace of her has ever been found. And one interesting thing is that even if her body had been completely decomposed to a point where we really wouldn't be able to find her, you know, match her or anything, she did have that iron rod in her leg, which is definitely not going to decompose. No. So that's always kind of given their family hope that maybe one day they will locate her remains. And with that metal rod, um, it would give like the, it would give the, I mean, obviously it's because it's, you know, it was the surgery was done in a hospital that, that metal rod probably, probably has like a, like a serial number. Yeah, it does. So if they yeah. were to find her remains, they could easily track her and figure out if it, was, figure her. Out if it was her. Yeah. That's if, a good if, point. If they had, you if, know, if yeah. they, if they had found anything, yeah. well, but they if, did actually, Oh, let's talk about theories though. First here, cause I think it's important to talk about some of the different theories about what may have happened to Leah. So investigators can't rule out foul play, but they've also found zero evidence to really suggest that she's been abducted or hurt in any way. Investigators still believe it's possible that Leah got into a wreck and then suffered the head injury and then just wandered away, disoriented and confused. And, you know, she may not even known who she was. I mean, it does happen. And she then could have wandered toward Mount Baker Highway and was picked up by somebody. Yeah. And this person could have been trying to help her, especially if she was injured, you know, and I mean, it happens. People have amnesia and they, you know, they find them years and years and years later mm -hmm. or never find or them. Or they become and, homeless yeah, and people exactly. just think they're alcoholics or something. That's really common. People and will be found on the street. confirmed legally dead. And yeah, I yeah. Mean, it's definitely a possibility. But it's also possible that if she was injured and confused that someone took advantage of that opportunity and kidnapped yeah, her. Yeah, there, there literally are. That's what's really scary is the idea that there's, people hunting out there. Mm -hmm. There's literal people that hunt for victims and just look for that, you know, that one girl that's by herself, you know, in a place, a remote location where mm -hmm. nobody will ever see what happens to her. And especially if this person, let's say had maybe talked to her at right. a bar, possibly right about her journey that she was on and where and she's could have going. heard. Wow. Hmm. So you left your home and didn't really tell anyone where you were going and you didn't tell anyone when you're going to be back. Perfect no one knows where you are. Yeah. It's like literally the perfect opportunity for someone. Yeah. Which is horrifying to think. Really about. scary. Another scary possibility is serial killer. I mean, there's always, you know, in any type of disappearance, there's always a possibility that there's a serial killer operating in this region. And that happened to be the case. Uh, serial killer Israel Keys was active in the Pacific Northwest in 2000, and he actually later admitted to killing four people in Washington state. He was actually known for hiding murder kits around the country, which was just basically things like weapons, bleach, plastic sheets, and money. And he'd drive long distances to dig up his murder kits and then abduct the first easy target he found. That is so scary. Yeah. He chose his victims entirely at random and never had any connection with them, making the cases nearly impossible to solve. And this method allowed him to continue killing undetected for at least 16 years. So Leo would have been kind of the perfect fit for the profile of a target for him. And she was traveling alone and no one knew where she was or where she was going. And obviously no cell phone to call for help. So it's super easy, honestly. She could have been taken by the man who called in the tip about his wife seeing Leah wandering outside a gas station. Maybe he might have been trying to misdirect the investigation somehow. Mm -hmm. And this would explain why he panicked and hung up without giving his name. The other possibility, though, is that Leah could have been kidnapped or hurt by somebody before the accident. And then after the abduction occurred, the accident was staged by this person to make mm -hmm. it look like she'd gotten into a wreck and just wandered off. 
Now, personally, that's what I think yeah, most I, likely happened. That's I mean, what the evidence points to at yeah, least. I, it just, it makes the most sense, especially if she was out and talking to local people. And I mean, who knows who else she talked to? It could have been that, that guy. could have been Barry. could have been anybody. Yeah. Because I was thinking too, like, well, what if somebody, you know, while she was at lunch and see, she stopped for the theater show and stuff, like, mm -hmm. what if somebody went out there and did the, you know, things to her car real quick while she was eating? But I get, I mean, again, no, who I would mean, do that in a parking lot and stuff? It'd be yeah, tough to pull true. that off. But is, is it possible? Maybe. But then, you know, yeah. that's still a ways away to drive with this car that would, it right. seems like it was done pretty the, close to where the accident happened. Right. The time frame yeah. from when the car was altered to the crash seems to be back to back to me. And I have a feeling that she probably wasn't that she could have already been gone when that happened, that they took the car out to stage the crash and make it look like a situation where she would have just left, you know, and if he had taken her valuable items with him as well and the ring and the money, it really could have looked like that's what happened. Yeah. That was kind of a strange move for whoever did that to not take those things. Well, I think they wanted to stage it, make it look legitimate that. that, that she, right. That she was in an accident and then left. Because clearly by amnesia. altering yeah, the vehicle, they already had that plan in their head. Mm -hmm. That was already the plan is that I'm I'm not going to search the vehicle because I don't want to take anything from it because it will and they don't want take evidence. away from it. And, and put, yeah. physical mm -hmm. getting into the vehicle is going to leave fibers That's and true. DNA true. in that vehicle, which they did leave DNA in it. But, mm. you know, still, I mean, you wouldn't want to go digging around in there and risk any more. But it's also possible that Leah disappeared on purpose and her Jeep was found very close to the U.S. Canada border. And if she decided she wanted a completely fresh start, maybe she decided it was best if her loved ones believed she was dead. But you can't get across the border without a passport. And she left her passport. And she left the ring. Right. The ring's not going to give it away or, you know, track you. Why wouldn't you want at least one important thing from your life? And the cash, the cash. I mean, I understand saving it, staging it for your family. People do stuff like that, of course. But why? I mean, just it's the cash and the ring that make that theory just so unbelievable for me. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe she met somebody along the way on the trip, you know, maybe somebody who lived in Canada, you know, a hitchhiker even that, you know, she maybe, or maybe she had somebody already planned to meet up with and nobody knows about it. Maybe they helped her stage it. Right. Which reminds mm. me of Maura Murray, the same type of possibility that there could have been yeah. tandem driver. There could have been some other person that right. she was trying to meet up with, maybe to go start a new life with. But again, all evidence and from what her family and friends say is that she was going to come back, that there was no inkling at all that she was just going to leave and be gone forever. And based mm -hmm. on what was found in the Jeep, I think you can pretty much yeah. say that that's not what happened because there is a theory that she had possibly picked up a hitchhiker. And that maybe she had put her mom's engagement ring under the mat to hide it from this person. And then maybe this person ended up deciding to rob her and kill her. But not take anything from the vehicle? Yeah. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was, you know, some type of mental breakdown or manic episode. I mean, she'd obviously gone through a ton of hardship and maybe it was just too much to handle and she just snapped and just ran off i mean it happens but again probably one of the less likely theories out there mm -hmm. she also said in her note that she wasn't suicidal but maybe this was a diversion and maybe she was going to go to this place of beauty in order to take her own life again all evidence and what people say about her is that this is absolutely not the case mm -hmm. uh, or maybe just crashing her jeep was an unfortunate accident and she ended up sleeping in it for a few days before taking off. This was something else that I thought too, is that from base mm -hmm. my whole description of how the things could have been set up that way in the Jeep before the crash Initially, happened. Yeah. But doesn't explain the wire being cut in the engine. Doesn't explain why would she tamper with her vehicle to then send her off the road. I mean, clearly somebody, somebody set this whole thing up. I think it's very clear from yeah. the evidence. And the police still don't know if her mystery companion named Barry even really exists. Barry could have been someone helping her disappear or he could have been made up by this man in the restaurant who, you know, wrote that tip in. So I called lean that way. Yeah. I mean, it seems kind of 
very made up to me and too convenient mm-hmm. to like have this perfect description and know the guy's name is Barry. Mm-hmm. Like, hmm. It was so like descriptive. Descriptive. Like, how you're really going to sit there and like syrup. Like, I couldn't, like, I, I've seen you so many times. I can't really describe you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, I'm, I mean, yeah. I'm also really bad at describing, but like, <laughs> you do have to like literally like analyze everything about them to give that kind of Someone, descript- right. des- like descriptive. Yeah, sure. totally. Mm-hmm. Like so many sketches look wild too. They're like, eh. but it's like he could have been describing Clint Eastwood for all we know. Yeah, that's true. Well, <laughs> that's, you can just think of someone and well, that's what I'm saying. Is that's what I think it is. Yeah, like it was somebody he had in his head that he just gave mm-hmm. to investigators, kind of throw throw everybody off the trail potentially. Right. right. This man could have been the one who really kidnapped or hurt Leah. But then again, maybe Leah talked about Barry with this man and pointed out a random person. She wanted to make him believe Barry was real to throw off the investigation and make it easier for her to disappear. Possibly. If Leah was taken and the crash site was staged by her kidnapper, the police may be searching the wrong area for a crime scene. It's possible that after March 13, 2000, she was never even in the Jeep. There's a slight chance that Leah wandered away from the crash and ended up starving or freezing to death or being attacked and killed by wild animals. There's always that possibility, but then again, you would probably find remains fairly quickly Mm -hmm. of some sort because you know there's always going to be something left behind especially with her metal rod right which on that note in 2014 and i don't know exactly what the source of this is i this comes from reddit and from some other source but we don't it doesn't have a lot of details let's just put it that way but in 2014 a mummified body was found in the area where leo disappeared and it matched her height and had a metal rod in the right femur. The rod inside the femur was traced to a shipment sent out in fall of 1998, which would be around the same time Leah was in a car accident. However, the body was identified as a male between the ages of 33 and 35, but the remains were so decayed, it's possible forensic analysis misclassified it because specific expertise is needed to determine if a mummified corpse would have been assigned male or female at birth. So, Mistakes are common, even with this expertise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's very possible that, you know, Leah had an intersex condition even that may have led her to being classified as male. Or that she may not have even known about. Or right. But who knows? I mean, this is like so sketch, this information. There's no other information other than that. And I didn't see like a news article. We this wanted is- to at least include it because it is like people that follow this case definitely talk about this. And but it's like a that, lot of people think it was her body, but it's just like, wouldn't that be like an official thing put out there? That's like, well, they're keeping a lot of stuff under wraps. You know, it seems like there's stuff that the police have that they're not discussing yeah. yet. seems like it's still active and still like gathering information on it. But yeah, I mean, that's basically where the trail ends. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the last bit of information and then it's gone quiet since about 2014 or so mm-hmm. there hasn't really been anything new as far as leah's case goes but just a little bit more information to leave you with on leah leah was 23 years old when she disappeared and she would be 45 years old this july she has blue eyes and sandy blonde hair she's five foot six and when she went missing she was 130 pounds at that time she was a smoker and a vegetarian she has a surgical scar on her right hip pierced ears a beauty mark above her lip and she speaks with a southern accent and is fluent in spanish leah's family and friends don't think that she disappeared by choice kara does not believe that her sister would cause them this much pain and suffering if she could help it especially after she and heath had lost both of their parents and now their sister i can understand leah's needing to get away and find some peace within herself but considering the loss that our families experience um, it's difficult for me to think that that she would leave us open for another loss like this it's difficult to imagine her wanting to distance herself from her family for as long as she has but of course you don't want to imagine the negative things that could have happened you don't ever know what someone's thinking in their head no matter what they tell you you still don't know not 100 percent. you never know that's why none of this makes sense to anybody it's so out of character for her in some ways and then in some ways it's not if any of you have any information on leah's disappearance or know of a possible sighting you can contact the whatcom county sheriff's office at 360-778-6600 or the whatcom communications dispatch center at 360-676-6711
while we were kind of going through this, I had one other thing that popped in my head that was kind of interesting because we literally just talked about Mother God and the Love Has Won cult. Oh, yeah. And, you know, not only is there the possibility of, you know, kind of going off the grid, leaving everything behind and just living off the land, which Mm -hmm. is possible. People do do that and do that in that area. But I also thought there are tons of groups out there. I don't think people realize how many cults exist in this country and how many cults that we don't even know about that exist. And is it possible that, you know, maybe she found some group of people that were really into this Dharma bums book or something or into this author's ideas Mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe made some type of cult or group off of that, that, you know, is all about leaving your old life behind. You know, it was interesting. She mentioned being reborn. Like she said, I've I've been Mm -hmm. reborn, Mm -hmm. which I feel like is a very, you know, strong term to use for somebody who says I've been reborn. And I found that really interesting. And, you know, then all of a sudden she leaves on this soul searching trip. You know, is it possible that she was going up to Washington? Because that's the thing is nobody knows exactly why she was going to this Mount Baker area other than the fact that this book Mm -hmm. and this author went there. But maybe could she have gone there and met up with a group at some point? And part of, you know, the initiation of getting into the group is that you have to leave it all behind and they stage your disappearance. Is it possible? I mean, I guess it's possible. And it's interesting. We did talk about this with James Renner when it came to Mara Murray's case. There are theories out there. There's been sightings of her, I believe, at, right. in a certain cult up there. And and people like yeah. when you join some of these cults, especially some of these Buddhist ones that, or, you know, other religious ones that have, you know, come from other parts of the world, mm-hmm. oftentimes they make you change your name. So you, she would change her name from Leah Roberts and then all of a sudden assume this other name that's completely, no one would ever make the connection between the two and then basically assume this whole new identity with this group of other believers of whatever you know belief system they have. Is it possible that she joined something like that and she's out there living her life I in mean, with this group of nomadics or maybe in a communal type living situation yeah it's possible yeah of course it's possible i think there probably would have been some more evidence of her like communicating with them that they would have found unless there's stuff that the police it's it's a theory it's an interesting theory i think foul play makes more sense i think someone took an opportunity of a girl who was on her own yeah and no one knew where she was scary man i mean there's there's people out in these remote areas of the country that yeah. Especially if you're you're a woman and you're out there by yourself, you got to be so so careful because yeah. some person that might look anyone. I mean, yeah, I think anyone. anyone. I understand that a lot of people find peace in being alone and especially traveling alone. And I know people that hike alone, and I always get so worried for my friends that do that. And they, I just think it's too much never, of a risk. Never go know? by yourself. They yeah. always say it's a buddy system, man, or yeah. at least. In today's day and age, like turn on your location or something. Yeah, <laughs> or, like, or let people notify know where people you are. where you're going. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, I do get the appeal of wanting to soul search and and find peace and just be in nature and be by yourself without any responsibilities. I do get that, but it it can put you at a lot of risk. It does, unfortunately. I mean, there is that serial killer operating up there, and yeah, who knows how many other countless serial killers are out there. Well, I'm devastated for Leah's family after everything they've been through, losing both parents and then now her and not having any answers after all this time is just the absolute worst. And I wish we could get a statement from them as far as, you know, this this weirdness from Reddit and the body. Yeah. yeah. I'm just confused about all that. And I think I want to make sure we put that out there with a grain of salt. Right. I think they're still like the police are still DNA testing yeah. and, and I think they're still investigating this. And I think yeah. there is a possibility that we will know something uh, more about hope. it soon. At least their family could have some closure at the end of this, you know? Yeah. I mean, is there ever closure for this type of thing? It's crazy. She would be not really in her forties now. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a long time. Yeah. It's passed. So really, really sad. But yeah, we'll leave all the information below for the Whatcom County Sheriff's office. If you do have any tips or, or sightings, but yeah, that is it for us today. That is. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mile Higher Podcast. Hopefully you found it interesting. Uh, if you did, be sure to drop us a like and subscribe on YouTube drop and Apple Podcasts. Like. We'd appreciate it. <laughs> drop a comment for Corelli for stepping in for Janelle today. Yes, an awesome A plus job. for Corelli's first episode of Mile yes. Higher. It's a whole nother beast. Thank you so much. But yeah, 
we will see you guys next week with another episode of the mile higher podcast but until then take your mind a mile, a mile higher, higher.